Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Medvention Seminar Series. My name is Paul, and I'm actually one of the Medvention interns here at Sunnybrook. Um, I I'm unfortunately wasn't able to be here today. So it is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Alan Co uh, Coley, pardon me, um, here who will be talking to us about a very exciting area of me medical device regulations and quality management systems. Alan Coley has earned a reputation as a respected regulatory and quality assurance executive with experience in both, uh, oh, pardon me, in both establishing established and early stage pharmaceuticals and biotechnology companies. Alan, uh, he is a graduate pharmacist with more than 25 years of senior management experience in international regulatory and quality positions, and has been successful in guiding first-in-class submissions with the FDA, Health Canada, and European regulators. Alan has been a man management representative implementing ISO 1345 quality systems and taking a lead role in audits for FDA, Canadian, and international regulatory authorities, as well as from a multitude of different suppliers. He has sat on many committees providing feedback and industry perspectives to the FDA and Health Canada in recent years. These committees have focused primarily on software and medical, as a medical device. Following a successful career in industry, Alan has started his own consulting company, Coley Consulting Incorporated, which specializes in regulatory and quality assurance support to the pharmaceutical and medical device industry. Again, Alan, thank you very much for being our guest lecturer today. I think it's been uh, misrepresented here today. It was, uh, Paul says it's a very exciting area. I, uh, I think it's the first time I've ever been introduced uh, giving this uh, lecture as an exciting area. But uh, we'll do our best to at least make it interesting, uh, if not exciting. So I'm um, going to talk a little bit about ISO 1345. What is it? Why should you care about it? Uh, a blueprint uh, for managing your business. Um, when I first started in the ISO systems, uh, I discovered very, very quickly, I, I, I had been very active in, in the management of um, a very large pharmaceutical company. And uh, I moved over to medical devices in 1985. And uh, I discovered very, very quickly that the framework around the ISO systems, oops, sorry, the framework around the ISO systems is just good business practices. And if you implement it properly, Thinking, it forces you to think about what you want to do from a business perspective with your product, with your customers, from a purchasing perspective with your suppliers. And then if you document that, train all your staff to follow the processes as you've written them, you'll be in good shape from a business perspective. I see some smiles, but it's true. It does work. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about the linkage between uh, 1345 and the Canadian regulations specifically, and I'll use them as an example, but it applies to the regulations internationally. The 1345 can be linked to the uh, 21 CFR 820, which is the US regulations. It can be linked to the Australian regulations. They're linked closely now with uh, the European regulations, and uh, Japan as well has, uh, has recently uh, link their processes to uh, ISO 1345. So what is it? Well, the title is uh, the Medical Device Quality Management Systems, the Requirements for Regulatory Purposes. But that's really not what this is all about. It's a system of integrated processes that drive your business in a systematic way to produce a repeatable product. I think all of that is, there's a lot in that sentence, okay? So it's integrated processes. So they link one with the other. They drive your business in a systematic way. So you've thought about it and there's a direction to each of these processes. There's an input and an output and a result that you're going to check. And the the result of implementing all of these processes effectively is that you have a, re a repeatable result, whether that be your product, whether that be your purchasing process, or uh, that's uh, a service that you're providing to your customers. 
talk just a little bit about the history of ISO 1345. It's based on the 9001 standard. We've all heard about that. The car industry has been advocating the 9001 standard for years and years and years. Um, they added some regulatory um, uh, requirements to the 9001 standard and called it the medical device version. That was uh, the original 1345 in 1996. Uh, it had 18 clauses to it, most of which were only marginally applicable to medical devices, but it was a good standard. It was better than what we had had until then. Um, in 2003, the standard was completely rewritten. It went down to eight clauses, but the requirement for continuous improvement was replaced with the requirement for continuous regulatory compliance. And that's a really critical aspect. Um, you you want to be in compliant with the regulator, compliant with the regulators and, and the regulations that govern your product. They're there for a reason. They, uh, you know, the US system is based on predicate devices, devices that have gone before you. And the, the class two controls that have been built for those devices are based on experiences that we've seen in the industry. So it's, they're a good roadmap for you to make sure you're checking all the boxes and uh, building your product effectively. So we added the requirement for regulatory compliance. Um, there was an option uh, previously, uh, they had a different standard called this 13488, which was the design controls. In 2003, we did away with 13488 and design was a built-in part of the process. We increased the focus on risk management and uh, as we talked about 2016, we'll see that risk management has an increased focus even yet again. And, and risk, uh, managing your risk, mitigating your risks is all of, it's built throughout the, uh, the standard. And then in 2003 version of the standard, it was largely harmonized with the US regulations to the point with those of us with experience in, in writing quality systems, could draft a single quality system that would be compliant with 1345, as well as with the US 21 CFR 820. And uh, so you didn't have to have separate quality systems for the US and Canada and other markets in the world. Okay, so what happened in 2016 version of the standard? They added the word consistently to the requirement to meet your customer and regulatory requirements. Um, so it's, you know, you might laugh at this, but you know, there are companies who uh, don't do this consistently, but you know, uh, once in every three years, they demonstrate they're, they're able to meet the regulatory and customer requirements. And so when they go in for their recertification audit, the, uh, the auditor says, oh, you, you've met your customer and regulatory requirements this year, so I get, you know, I'll give you the certification. Keep going in that direction. It's, you know, uh, the last two years have been pretty rough, but, you know, keep going in that direction. And then they go back the next year, and they're not meeting that requirement anymore. So the word consistently has been added to this standard. They've added a section to define the activity of the person who's claiming compliance to this standard. And that's really, really important because now we can have a distributor or an importer or, or an authorized representative or even a contract manufacturer claim compliance to ISO 1345. They don't necessarily um, claim compliance to all of the sections of 1345 just the ones that apply to their activity. But it will give them a certificate that makes it a lot easier for us as manufacturers or people holding the regulatory file for a product to qualify them and bring them into um, uh, our supplier base. Remember that a product can be a service. So, 
uh, there are a lot of companies out there that exist for servicing MRIs, as an example. Um, you know, you, you may have a, a G, GE or a Siemens MRI, but it's being serviced by a third party. That third party can now claim compliance to 1345 if they have the right procedures and processes in place. Risk management now applies to all activities right across the board. We used to have this vague statement that said that you had to qualify your suppliers based on risk. Well, what does that mean? Probably means something different to you than it does to me. But now the standard is very, very specific about using risk management processes from the 14971 standard, which is the risk management standard. Use those processes for identifying the risk that your supplier provides to your business, to your product, and to your supply chain, and evaluate all of those, same as you would a product risk, and then qualify that supplier based on that level of risk that that supplier holds. And regulatory compliance is a requirement now under the standard. It's always been a requirement, but it was never stated anywhere. So now it's seen as, a, as a, what it should be, a requirement. Oop, there we go. So uh, this is probably when I ask, you know, what is 1345? This is probably closer to what you were thinking. You know, it's written instructions describing processes. So some of the areas in which uh, you're going to have written instructions will include, you know, who you are as a company. You know, what role do you play? Are you a manufacturer, a distributor, etc.? How do you control your documents and your records? You know, version control. How do you lock them up to make sure that they, the quality of that record is maintained? And so that two years from now when the FDA or Health Canada walks through the door or an ISO auditor asks to look at those records, they're still in pristine condition and you can read what was written on the record and nobody spilled coffee or water or whatever all over that original record. Because that's, that's the basis of which you demonstrate compliance. Management's role and uh, that big part of that role is the oversight of the entire quality system. Resource management from both a human and an infrastructure perspective. We'll talk a little bit more about that. The product realization process from an idea or a concept right through to the transfer to the manufacturing process. Uh, customer contacts. How are you going to communicate with your customers? How are you going to review those communications to make sure there's no complaints uh, or um, if you're servicing a customer? How are you going to review your service records to make sure that there's no hidden complaints in there? Serve an item requiring servicing more frequently than you had planned is a complaint, right? So you need to investigate that. And then how are you going to measure, analyze your results uh, based on all of your processes? Okay, deciding who you are as a company. So I. Now there's this new function where you can define your role. So you could be a manufacturer who's the person whose name is on the label, not necessarily the person who fabricates the product. There's a difference. If you put your name on the label, you are the legal manufacturer, and you are required to meet the um, requirements within ISO 1345. The actual fabrication can be done through a supplier. The authorized representative is the person who legally represents the manufacturer in a particular jurisdiction. So in Canada, that would be the regulatory correspondent. In Europe, they're actually called the authorized representative. In the U.S., they're called the regulatory, I think it's a regulatory, no, it's not. It's the U.S. representative. Um, is what they call it down there. And a distributor is a person who sells, um, sorry, the importer is the 
person in the supply chain who first makes the product um, manufactured in a different country available in the country where it's sold. Very convoluted language, um, but essentially it's a person who brings the product across the border and makes it available for sale. And then the distributor sells devices to the end users. So choose who you are within that uh, group of activities. Scope out your, your system. Make a statement that describes who, what you do. You know, do you design and develop? Do you produce? Do you store? Do you distribute? Do you install? Or do you service you, these devices that are on the market? You can be any one or all of those. Um, your scope statement also describes the, the area that you're involved in. So you could be somebody who services MRI equipment by GE, or maybe you have GE and seniors. Um, or you could be a design and development house of cardiovascular products. They could be, um, you may even go so far as to define them as, as um, uh, products that are implanted uh, in, into a patient, because cardiovascular products could be ones that are used for a period and then withdrawn, or they could be ones that are left behind, like a stent or a drug-eluting stent. And then some of your activities can be outsourced, and they're outsourced to qualified suppliers. We'll talk a little bit about those qualified suppliers in a minute. So this is uh, ISO 1345. The certification process is a legal contract between you, the company, and the regulator. You're going to provide a copy of your certificate to each regulator which you register a product with, and that's going to stand for compliance to this standard that'll give the regulator confidence that you're meeting the requirements of their regulations for whatever you do, whether it be manufacture, import, distribute, etc. Okay, I talked about the system providing a blueprint for just good business practices. So if you outsource, use qualified suppliers. A lot of early startups skip this phase, and it's, it's a detriment uh, because when you're, you're ready to put your product on the market, you go for your ISO 1345 certification, and you discover that the supplier that's pro providing this widget for you is, you know, they've been changing this thing slightly for, you know, years and years and years, and as that's why you were having all those problems in development, and you never came across that, right? That happens far too often in, in this industry. Your purchasing process, you're not only gonna identify your, your suppliers, but you're gonna identify spending limits, different, or, different people within your organization. Your customer contacts, they're gonna provide some feedback to you, um, they should actually provide early feedback to you. You know, you've got a design concept in your head. You should go talk to customers and have them input into that design. You'd be amazed what wonderful ideas you get from potential customers. And you'll have a much better design if you do that. So while your business plan describes the product, the people, the customers, the resources needed, financial investment versus financial return, your quality plan talks about your product, your resources, your customer requirements, your risks and mitigations that are used in the design, manufacture, test, package, labeling, storing, shipping, installing, servicing, et cetera, of the product so that it performs consistently. If your product is temperature sensitive, you gotta label it that way. And you gotta make sure that your storage and distribution chain takes that into account. Okay, so let's take a really quick 10,000 foot run through of ISO 1345. Um, yeah, this, you are not going to fully understand ISO 1345 from this next 20 minutes or so, but you will understand the 
headlines or the 10,000 foot level topics that are addressed within this. So there are eight clauses. The first three are administrative. One talks about the scope, um, two talks about the, the regulatory jurisdictions where your activity is, and three talks about the definitions within the standard. Section four is about your documentation. We'll go into the, each of these in a little bit of detail in a second, but section four talks about your documentation, including records, how you're gonna create them, how you're gonna store them. Section five talks about management's responsibility to the QMS, to making sure that your product is safe and effective and to making sure your customers have input into your processes, particularly your product processes. Six talks about your resource management processes, which includes people, infrastructure, whether you need a clean room or whether your product can be produced just in an ordinary environment. Um, it talks about um, IT, you know, your infrastructure can include your IT programs. Um, we'll talk about all of those in a bit of detail. Seven is your product realization process. So when people think of ISO, they think about, you know, building a product. That's only this one section of this particular standard. The rest of it is about the processes around ensuring that product is safe and effective. And then section eight is to measure, analyze, and improve. And that has drastically expanded in the 2016 version and we now have a much better linkage to the regulations, at least in Canada, with, uh, with the standard, or with the, um, yeah, with the standard. So let's talk about documentation requirements. So there's a requirement that you have a quality policy and quality objectives. Your quality objectives, just like your business objectives, should be measurable objectives. You should review them on a regular basis, make sure they're consistent. You should measure how you're performing against those, those objectives. And uh, for that, ISO puts together a process called management review, where you bring in all of the data that you've analyzed out of Section 8 of this standard, you bring it to management, and uh, you share how you're doing towards your objectives. There's a requirement for a quality manual. Quality manual is just a summary of all of those sections and how you intend to link those to your business processes. Um, there's a requirement for standard operating procedures, SOPs as they're commonly called. Uh, SOPs are, are usually linked to forms, forms being uh, something that you fill out to create a record. Sometimes forms are a template uh, that will form the basis by which you'll create a record, like um, your market requirement specifications. If you're developing a new product, you'll have market requirement specifications, sometimes called uh, usability requirements or, or customer requirements. Those requirements, you may have a template for how you're gonna collect those, but they need to be done in front of the customer. You're gonna generate records that are gonna demonstrate effective planning, operation, and control of your processes. That means you're gonna have internal audits that are gonna look at each of these processes in detail and see how you're doing. And then there's other documentation that's required by jurisdiction-specific regulations, things like um, complaint records, things like mandatory problem reports to your health authority. There's some what we call files within the standard. Um, there are four of them, three here and one on the next slide. One is a design history file. These are all the records that you generated during the development of your product. And you know, in the days when we did this using paper, this was classically like 10 to 15 binders worth of paper. This is a lot of paper. A lot of documentation. Uh, now most companies are doing this electronically, but it's still an awful lot of records that are being generated. You have several phases of development that you're going to go through. You're going to start with a concept. 
you're going to go to a planning phase, then a design phase, maybe an, an alpha design phase and a beta design phase. Many companies split it up that way. And then you, once you're comfortable there, you're going to go through design verification and validation and transfer that product to your, your production facility and then put it under design control to make sure that any changes that you make to that product are properly evaluated and show that there's no impact on either the performance or uh, efficacy of that product. So that's your design history file. There's a risk management file that ta you, you're going to identify all the risks that you think are there for your product at each stage of development. You can update this file because at concept phase, you have a vision of what the risks might be and you're going to rate those and you're going to mitigate those risks. But when you go through your planning process and you discover, you know, certain things aren't going to work the way you hope they would. And as you go further down into the design process, you build your first alpha prototype and discover, ah, these things don't fit together quite the way I'd hoped they would. And we've got to do things a little bit differently. You've got to update your, your risk file at all of those stages with any new risks that you've identified. And, and monitor the literature as you're designing your product because uh, you're going to discover that somebody else's product that might be similar or is intended to do something similar has had uh, some side effects associated with it or some, some problems in the field. So, you know, you've got to add those into your risk file or, or assess those to determine whether your product has those same risks or not. Risks can be supplier risks. You may discover that one of your one of your major suppliers has been bought out by another company and uh, you know so now you've got a, a product risk uh, so you need to assess that risk and determine whether there's alternate suppliers that you can put in place there's something called the device history record this is how your product was made every i encourage my clients like even your alpha prototype should have a, a device history record, okay? They don't like to do that, but how else do you know what you put in that device unless you have a device history record? So this should be like the serial number of any uh, boards or any um, parts that you put in there. You know, if you bought them from somewhere else, put the part number and the serial number in your device history record so that you know what's there. And it's the only way you're going to be able to troubleshoot problems is by having a record of what's there. It provides that traceability once products on the market. If you bought a bad lot of resistors, you've got to be able to go back and recall all of the products that have that resistor, that lot of resistors within it. So your, design, your device history record is the process of, for doing that. The standard now refers to something called a device or a medical device file. So this is a, essentially soup to nuts uh, from the very concept of your product right through to your post-marketing surveillance on your product uh, file. So you're allowed to use referencing of other files to build this file. So I would encourage people to you know, reference your, your design history file with this file. Um, because th all of the descriptions of your device, all, all of these first elements here, uh, including the labeling, etc., will all be in your device history file, right? Your product specifications uh, are, will be in your device history file as well. That's what you've transferred at the end of... of um, sorry, your design history file. That's what you've transferred at the end of design to your manufacturer. Um, there's a requirement now for uh, release procedures and limits of, of what you're going to accept on your device. So uh, those need to be in your um, medical device file. Records of installation and servicing are part of your medical device. You should 
evaluate your risks on an annual basis. You should do that by looking at literature, by looking at customer feedback, by looking at your complaints, and, and putting that evaluation in your, in your uh, medical device file. Uh, so those are the uh, documentation and, and records from a very, very high level. Management's responsibility. Management really needs to demonstrate a commitment to the quality management system. Um, I've had the opportunity of working with probably close to 100 different medical device companies now. Where senior management, meaning the CEO, everybody, all the C-level executives, where those guys have a commitment to the quality management system, things work quite well within the organization. When then those guys know that there's a quality management system out there, but that's, you know, quality looks after that and keeps me out of jail, it tends not to work quite as well. So if you ever find yourselves at that C level of an organization, remember that because your commitment is picked up incredibly quickly by everybody in your organization. And as I said, if you've got a good quality system, it's integrated with your business processes, and therefore your commitment as the CEO to, to the quality system just means that you're committed to your business processes. Part of that is determining what your customer wants and meeting those requirements. Really good uh, C level. Um, People do this daily, and driving this down within your organization is really, really important. Making sure planning occurs, you know. It takes a good two years to bring a product to market. If you don't plan that properly, it's going to take you several years, and you're going to have lost a ton of market opportunity to say nothing about spending. If you're a startup, you'll be, you know, spending money, going to your investors hand in, hand in mouth, right, saying, you know, I need a few more million. And they say, well, what have you done for me lately, right? So putting good planning in place is really, really critical. Define, document, and communicate responsibility and authority throughout your organization. You can do this very effectively with job descriptions. Um, I've been into companies, I went into a company not very long ago, been operating for seven years, and nobody had a job description. Um, it just amazes me that, that that can still happen in this day and age. It's a requirement under under labor law now in Ontario, never mind good business practices. Like, you know, so, yeah. Um, conduct your management review meetings. Focus on your, man your metrics, your, pro your management metrics, right? Your corporate metrics during those management review meetings. Are you meeting your objectives? What do you need to change in order that you're going to meet those objectives? Resource requirements. So identify and provide adequate resources. That's like the beginning of this section within the standard. Sounds really easy, right? Identify and provide adequate resources. But that includes, you know, human resources, but it's not just finding a body to put in place. It's training that person, making sure they have the right skills, you know, choosing the right person for the job. You know, what is the competency level of the person you're hiring? What's their experience? Have they ever done this before? Are you starting from scratch? What does your infrastructure look like? Um, do you have an infrastructure? You know, is the infrastructure that you have going to be one that you can actually build on and uh, expand your company and meet what you think are going to be the demand for the product? If not, Find a plan for a better way of doing it. 
your supporting services, things like storage, transportation, and IT. You know, I went into one company, they had a beautiful production line. Um, they running very smoothly. Actually, they had very good processes. They had nowhere to store the product coming off the end of the line. No warehouse facilities at all, zero. And uh, yeah, what do you do? <laughs> you can't go and get a storage locker and just throw your device into the storage locker. That will not work. It will not fly with the regulator. It will not fly with the ISO guy when he comes to audit you. What's your work environment look like? You know, do you need a clean facility? How clean does it need to be? You know, does it just need to be, you know, ISO 8 standard, like 100,000 particles? Or do you need ISO 5, you know, where you're looking at, you know, 1,000 particles? So define the level of cleanliness. Do you need uh, electrostatic discharge? Do you need a process? Do you need special mats? Do you need straps on the people working there? just to make sure that there's no discharge that's going to you know, blow up any boards that you're making or assembly. Even the assembly process of these boards can sometimes blow up the diodes that are in them. Uh, lab coats, gloves, hair coverings, things like that. You know, if you're building, uh, if you're building an IVD, uh, in vitro diagnostic device that, that has like a DNA diagnostic or something, the last thing you want is the person you know, that's filling the tubes on the line, getting their hair in there, and throwing the results all off. Okay, product realization. Uh, risk management, as I said, the risk file is a really big part of this standard and becoming more and more important uh, as we understand its value more. Uh, there are several risk management methods. Um, it's really great to start with a hazard analysis uh, because hazard analysis is relatively high level. You're looking at five or six to eight things that you can focus on. What are the hazards related to your product? And find mitigations for those hazards. Uh, a failure mode and effect analysis. Um, you do this during your design process. Do it again during your manufacturing process because your, your manufacturing process may introduce new failure modes uh, into the device. Your risk mitigations need to be checked um, and verified that they actually mitigate the risk and um, they, they produce the expected results. And you're only going to know that after you build your alpha, alpha prototype and you start doing some testing. And... Uh, Lots of CEOs get really upset when you go to them and say, you know that mitigation that we thought was going to work? Yeah, we got to start over again. Yeah, You don't want to have that conversation. So spend the time up front. Risk putting these FMEAs, putting these hazard analysis together. I'll be the first one to admit that these are very, very long, boring, frustrating meetings to the to live through, but uh, they are really, really important. And if your engineers have done the work up front to, to sort of highlight the, the, the critical areas that they see, then the team can do a better job of identifying what, that, what the level of risk that that um, area uh, brings to fault and what the mitigation should be. So. Just spend the time, do it properly, and you'll save yourself a ton of heartache. So I've just put this up there uh, because, you know, the old V model is still a great model, not for software. Software has gone to agile and water, you know, waterfall methods and everything else now. Nobody uses the V model anymore in software. But from a hardware perspective, it's great because you know you have your requirements, you have your design, you have your, your product that you develop, and then you verify against your design and you validate against your customer's requirements, right? It's really, really simple. People get confused about verification and validation all the time. Um, I, 
it's taken a couple of years now, but a client I'm working with now, the engineer said to me the other day, I finally figured out the difference between verification and validation. And, you know, that's a aha moment, right? So the, this is a real easy way to think about it, right? What the customer wants, you validate with. What the design needs, you verify to. And this is your development phase, right? <clears throat> Product realization. So make sure you include the regulatory requirements in your planning. Uh, it boggles my mind when I look at a development plan for a new product and, you know, they haven't checked out what the regulatory requirements are. You know, if you, the, most products have very good class two controls uh, on the FDA website that will give you a lot of good guidance on your product. Even if your product is a PMA product, in other words, it's a novel new class of product, chances are it's very similar to something else that is a class two. Um, and you can go and have a look at, you know, the requirements for those elements, right? If, if you got, a brand new model for for keeping people alive that maybe has a respirator and uh, and a uh, uh, ACD unit and all these things a cardiac defibrillator all built into these things. Uh, all of those elements combined in one device are going to be a PMA, but. All of those specific elements already have great class two controls on the FDA website. So make sure you're ticking the box by looking at those controls before you finalize your design. Make sure you thought about installation and servicing. You know, too many people send the product out the door. Um, I had, there was an ophthalmologist in Mississauga called me up and said, I have six devices sitting here in my office that companies have sent me. I have no idea how to make them work. What do I do? And I said, well, I hope you didn't pay anything for them, but uh, you know, th this guy happens to be a world-renowned ophthalmologist and people send them his, their devices to try out. But you know, it's no good just to send the device with a user manual. You know, You've got to teach people how to use something. Yeah, I, I, I'll make some. I won't make comments because this is public. But none of us really like to read manuals, right? Right. Nothing I hate more than when my daughter walks home with a big box from IKEA. Because I know I'm going to be sitting there and looking at this thing, trying to figure out how to put it together. <laughs> okay? We're all built that way, or most of us are built that way. So, like, think about the installation. Think about training people how to use your product. Don't just throw it on their doorstep. Make sure you got some post delivery follow up. You know, like, just call the customer up. You know, How's that device working? Oh, I haven't had a chance to unpack it yet. Oh, okay, there's your first hint that something's wrong, right? Change control is a big part of product development. After you're at the, you should be having um, change control like right at your, your, at the end of alpha phase of your design. So your beta design is, is the product that you intend to take to market. You're gonna do your clinical trials on your beta design product, but you should have change control at alpha, right? So that you're, you're formally changing the device by evaluating its effect on the change on, on the effect on performance, on the regulatory requirements um, early on in the development phase. Purchasing is part of this section seven, you know, define your purchasing process, evaluate your suppliers based on risk. Supplier evaluation though is an ongoing thing. You know, just because a guy has been a great supplier to you for the last 10 years, something may have happened and you should be evaluating that supplier. And if you get three lots in a row that aren't working, you better be picking up the phone 
and and finding out what's changed. You know, has he got a new guy in charge of production? Have they are they under cost pressures? Have they been bought by somebody? You know, what's happened? Something's clearly happened. You need to have written procedures for your product acceptance agreements with your suppliers, and they should be in writing. They should be there. They should be legal agreements with your suppliers. Uh, we are they. Um, the agreements will be based on risk. What that means is that your high-risk suppliers, you, you, you got to have a, an agreement with them. Your medium risk, that's up to you. But uh, depending on how risky your product is, um, if you're a high-risk product, I would even have a quality agreements with my medium-risk suppliers. Your low-risk suppliers, these are generally, you know, they produce a generic product that you can get from 25 different people. Uh, you don't need, need a quality agreement with them, although you should have terms of purchase on your purchase orders. And you need to have traceability in the event of a recall. Okay, production and servicing. You need to have a defined process again for production and servicing. Qualify your infrastructure. When you're servicing the product, does it need to be in a clean environment? Do you need ESD straps for your service technicians, et cetera, et cetera? Document your monitoring and measuring activities. So if you're, if you're going out to service a product and it needs calibration, you better have the particular unit that you're using to calibrate with, that better be within calibration. You better have records of its calibration. And you yourself should have, the service technician should have a training record that they can leave with the customer to show that they're trained to service that particular device. Document your labeling and packaging. Uh, this is, uh, we've always been required to document our labeling and packaging, but now there's this new thing called UDI, um, Unique Device Identifiers. And uh, all class three devices in uh, the US require unique device identifiers. Uh, Europe, I think as of 2019 it is, class 2B and 3s require UDIs. Canada accepts UDIs. We don't technically require a UDI, although we do require a unique uh, identifier for the product, but not necessarily in the, in the format that uh, the US and um, Europe have mandated, although we will accept that format. Um, and then you should have a written release for your product at the end of production. And that written release should include an independent review. That's classically your quality assurance person, right? They're reviewing documentation. They're not doing any testing. They're reviewing the documentation to show that that product, give them confidence that product is safe. Uh, your installation activities, you could use a qualified third party, but they must be qualified. And you should have records. And review your service records for potential complaints. Okay, monitoring and measuring. Make sure your system is fit for purpose, right? Uh, calibrate and maintain on a scheduled, on a schedule. Ignore the top of this. This is a typo on my slide. I'm sorry, if I look confused there. I am confused. This is monitoring, measuring devices. This is still part of section seven. So you gotta make sure that anything you're using as, um, uh, as a measuring device, it could be an ohm meter or something like that, it's fit for purpose, it's calibrated, it's maintained on a scheduled basis. You've got it labeled as to its status. Is it calibrated or, or is it you know, due for maintenance? Um, protected against unauthorized adjustments. Assess the impact on the product when equipment is found to be out of calibration. So all product that you've produced using that device when it was found to be out of calibration needs to be assessed to see if there's a risk there. And then maintain records of, uh, you know, the installation qualification of, of your products, the operational qualification, and um, the, all the calibration records and maintenance records, et cetera. This is section eight, measure, analyze, and improve your system. So you need to have a plan for doing that. That plan has to have some statistical techniques in it. 
and you need to demonstrate conformity of your product, ensure that conformity of your, of your quality management system is in place, and maintain the effectiveness of your quality management system. To do that, you're going to look at feedback, not only from your customers, but also from your production facility. You know, how many non-conforming products did you have come out of production? How many in-process failures did you have? Um, you're going to look at your customer complaints once they get the product. Can, do they know how to use it? Sometimes it's just a training thing, but sometimes the product was, uh, had a faulty part in it. Do you need to do a recall? Um, you know, look at servicing reports. Report problems, mandatory problems, where a person's had an event that caused a, a prolongation of their, of their um, uh, medical treatment requires uh, notification to the regulatory authority. So make sure you're reporting those problems. Do internal audits of your system to make sure it's performing the way you want. And then you need a corrective and preventive action process. So document your procedure. Your procedure needs to identify how you're going to identify a root cause. So, you know, classically, it's like, um, uh, you know, you do an internal audit and you identify that um, your incidence of non-conforming material has gone up tenfold in the last three months, right? So why? Why did that happen? So you know, somebody says, well, you know, this particular part keeps failing. Well, why is that failing? Is, you know, did the supplier change something? Figure out what's wrong there. So it's classically called the five whys. I like using it because it's simple. If you get to know me, you know I like things kept simple. Um, and then once you've identified your root cause, you correct the root cause. Um, Verify any actions that you did to correct the root cause to make sure it doesn't adversely affect your device and review uh, the effectiveness of that action because you know maybe it didn't correct your device or if it did correct your device, maybe it caused some other problem. There's a pro you need a process for non-conforming products, those that occur before you release the product for sale and those that occur after. You could have a non-conforming product that is identified after it's released for sale, and that's classically a recall. Okay, just uh, two minutes here on the linkage to the Canadian regulations. Um, Section 32 of the medical device regulations requires you as a manufacturer to submit a copy of your ISO certificate with a scope that matches the device that you're submitting for licensing uh, at the time you submit it to Health Canada. As of January 1st, 2019, Health Canada will only accept 2016 uh, certifications. Uh, sections of the CM, the Canadian Medical Device Regulations, sections 10 to 20 deal with safety and efficacy, which can be directly linked to the design controls in, in the standard. Section 52 of the Canadian regs talks about distribution records, which is section four of your standard. Complaints is in section 57 of the Canadian regs, which is 822 of the uh, standard. Problem reports or mandatory problem reports is uh, section 58 of the regulations and uh, section 823 of the standard. And then recalls. Uh, is section 63 of the regulations, which is section 833 of the standard. You've got a very tight linkage there, and make sure that your procedure considers both the standard and the regulations in the countries that you're marketing your products, because you may have to make some tweaks. So, for instance, in Canada, we have 10 days to make a mandatory problem report. In the U.S., you have five days. So make sure that your procedure recognizes the difference between the countries. Okay, just a few words in conclusion. A well-designed quality system provides the how-to for your business processes. The QMS allows your organization to grow, providing a framework for consistent functioning of your business. Implementation has to be led from top management. Without 100% commitment, processes won't function. 
and you need an expert to help guide you. Not because uh, you couldn't do it yourself, but because you need somebody who's been doing this for a long time. Com compliance now to the ISO 1345 2016 standard will provide you access to most of the world. Even countries in Asia now are adopting this standard as the regulatory processes or, or linking to the regulatory processes. And that's it. So open the floor to questions. Uh, um, I'm wondering, do you think that maybe a better word uh, for instead of all these systems, maybe a better word could be uh, system? Yeah. It could be, but uh, I, I think, uh, so the question is whether quality system is a better word than consistent, or consistency system would be a better word than quality system. Very well might be, but uh, they've been called quality systems since the 50s, and I don't think we're going to change things now, so sorry about that. Yeah? You talked about starting from alpha, then moving to beta, but so often we think companies would be coming in midstream, where somebody would step in when it's... You know, and you look back, you know, none of that has occurred. Yeah. So is that, is that, you know, yeah. A I mean, yeah, the most common thing that happens uh, for me is that I get a call from a guy who's raised a pot load of money and got a device that's working and ready to go to market and calls me up and says, I talked to Health Canada and they tell me that I need this thing called ISO 1345. My device is already designed. It's ready to go to market. Like, I'm sorry, but your design, device is not designed in, in, view, in the view of the regulators. And you've got to go back and you've got to, you know, re redo a lot of what has probably been done for your product under some design controls. Um, you have to go back beyond the prior iteration, like if you were, can you go back to the beginning of beta? It, it all depends on how good a job you've done of design controls. So some people, there are situations that I've been called in where, where companies have had design controls in place. They haven't had a quality system, but they've had design controls. Uh, they may not even have called it design controls, but they've had design controls. And you can sometimes, you know, fill backfill to, to make things work. But more often than not, i found that the best we can do is bring it to like an alpha design um, where we still have to, you know, do at least one more iteration, maybe two, before that product has got enough documentation around it to, uh, to put it on the market. There's a lot of risk with management, yeah. identifying risk, and then you're talking about teams. So in a bigger company, you have teams of engineers, uh, teams training in that, that uh, contribute to identifying risk. When you're talking with these small companies that just got a bunch of a ton of money, a device ready to go, and now you're going back to build this quality system, I guess it's kind of the exact question too. Which I hope. How do you go about risk, identifying risk, when you already have a device that's ready to be patient? Yeah. Who would be the best person to do that with a two or three person? Right. Well, I, I mean, the two or three people, so the question is, you know, who's the best person in a small two to three person company to do the risk management process? Um, those two to three people probably know that device really, really well. And the classic part of design controls that's missing when I get the call saying the product's ready to go to market is they haven't done any risk mitigations at all. Or if they have, they're like on the back of a napkin somewhere. They haven't followed a proper process. So they need somebody to first train them what, you know, those two or three people in a small company um, need to get some proper training on risk management first. So they understand what they're doing and, you know, do a hazard analysis is usually an easy way to start and then do an FMEA. Um, you know, I, I did one with a company and I told them it was going to take three days to do and we ended up spending seven days doing it because, you know, 
it was first time for everybody. There was a lot of discussion. Why are we doing this particular element of it? Do we really care? You know, and then a lot of argument. Is this a one, two, or three? You know, so it's a, it's a process. And, and risk is meant to be a process. And you learn a lot about your product in the risk management process. And lots of engineers walk out of the risk management process thinking differently about their product and what they want to do to mitigate risks. So, yeah. There, there's only a handful of people that are really good at, at uh, training on risk management. Um, uh, I have a couple of names that, you know, if, if you're interested, I can let you know. But um, kind of a, So many of us are probably have some aspirations of starting startups or going along the <laughs> entrepreneurial route. Mm. And maybe in a lot of those situations, people tend to be cash trapped, so they can't exactly yep. hire someone right away from to yep. experience this. So where can we go and start learning about this? Start understanding this <laughs> QMS systems and regular right. business, everything here. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, FDA has really good guidance document on design controls. And what I would suggest is that you actually not start with a full QMS system, but start with design controls because that is really, really critical. Um, BSI is a British Standards Institute, has a training facility out by the airport, and for like $1,500 or so, uh, you can take courses on ISO 1345 and on ISO uh, for, uh, 14971, both of which you really need to be familiar with um, uh, as you, start designing your product um, and I know it's fifteen hundred dollars but it's a whole lot better than you know fifty thousand dollars on somebody to help you build your your quality management system so okay well thank you very much and thank you for uh, being our guest lecturer today <laughs>